Maybe the biggest word in the English language is why, W-H-Y. It's almost the first words that a baby speaks, why this and why that and why the other. And the word gets bigger as you get older. Why did this loved one die so early? Why did this one get sick? Why did we lose our job? Why did I want to marry this one and they wouldn't marry me? Why is a mighty big word. In the realm of spiritual things, it's a mighty big word too. Why do we have this temptation? Why does this befall us? If we don't look back to find some causes, you know, we won't ever understand life. We must know why things are happening. In the book of Job, he had to have some answers. He lost his children, he lost his sheep and his goats and his camels and his house, almost lost his wife. <laughs> she said, curse God and die. He didn't want to do that. Why is a mighty big word. And in my ministry, I had to find some purpose in life. And I had to find some reasons why certain things happen to people. And I ran on to some of the greatest discoveries that a man can know. And we're going to teach you those in our lesson that we're going to give on the battle of the ages. There is a battle that's raging, but it's raging on to victory, not lost, but won. With our chart here, we can show you something of this battle. We can show you, for example, that in this battle, there are three great areas. It was fought in heaven, it was fought in earth, and it was fought in hell. Now we know it was fought in hell because Jesus went down and, and preached to the spirits in prison here. And also he went into hell and he fought with Lucifer and bruised his head. So there were three areas. And actually there are three kinds of beings that the battle is raging about. It's a deistic battle because God was involved in it. And it certainly is a battle of man because Adam and Eve, they lost in the battle. And then it is demonic. The devil, who is Lucifer, uh, is very much a part of this battle. I believe we can help you to understand the mysteries of life and to let you know that life is a battle. Believe me, life is a battle. Whether you want to fight or not, life is a battle. You must fight the devil. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. The word resist is a powerful word. And it's a word that you must come to know and to understand and to, to realize. Resist the devil. In the same way, we must resist disease. The Bible says if any is sick among you, let him call. You know, call. You don't just sit there and get sick. You call for the elders of the church. Let them come and do something. I'll anoint you with oil. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord would raise him up. It's an action. It's a resistance movement. The Christian movement is a resistance movement. We resist the devil. We resist sin. We are to battle against sin as if it was a cobra. You don't play with sin. You battle with it. Well, this means we're in a war. Now, if you come to, to know God and to love God, you must realize that God and the devil are enemies. And when you decide to work with God, you've left his camp on the other side. Therefore, you're going to have to battle him. He isn't going to sit by and, and lose you. And so if a strange thing happens to you, let's see if it's just nature, you know. Let's see if it's just natural. Or see if behind that problem there is a demonic influences. In this lesson, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that down through the story of mankind that I'm going to give you, the devil worked and he hurt people. And we must resist him and fight him in order to have the victories that we must have. And also in studying this, I came to know some truths that are really thrilling. For example, who are the sons of God? in Job 1 and 2 that appeared before God 
and talk to God about Job. Who are they anyway? Who are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 that we'll be talking to you about that caused the flood to come upon the face of the earth? Who were these sons of God? Then who was Melchizedek, this priest of the Most High God? This Melchizedek that Abraham came to know. And this Melchizedek that Hebrews chapter 7 says he was without beginning of days or end of life. Who was this mystery priest of the ages, Melchizedek? I will be teaching you that there are three priesthoods and that the total involvement from eternity, from eternity to eternity, here has to do with three priesthoods. The Melchizedek priesthood involved this total area through here until Abraham was chosen. And when Abraham was chosen, God chose Abraham. And through the loins of Abraham, God said, I will have a priesthood. And that was the beginning of the Aaron priesthood in this area here. And with the Aaronic priesthood, it went to the final priesthood. This is our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have the Christian priesthood that continues from this area through here. Someday in the future, we'll be teaching you the complete, amazing, and glorious story. But in the three priesthoods, we learn the riddle of man. And we also realize that God has been working for man in every dispensation and under every priesthood. Also, we will learn that the globe on which we live uh, was one time in one piece. The, the scientists call it Gondwana land. It was in one piece. And in Genesis chapter 10, it tells us that it was divided. In this study, I'll show you why it was divided. And then also we will learn some great truths like we have 2,000 languages on the earth today. And we'll show you how these languages got here. They didn't get here by accident. These 2,000 languages on the face of the earth right now came to us because of a cataclysmic event that took place in this period right here. And we'll show you that this was all part of the battle of the ages, you see? Part of the battle that's been raging from the Garden of Eden. It has raged and it will continue until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to receive unto himself those that love him. Also, I used to wonder who were the people that Jesus preached to in prison. The Bible says that he went and preached to the spirits that were in prison uh, during the time that he was in the heart of the earth. We will show you who they were. These were not ones that had had a first chance already. We don't believe in people getting a second chance. The Bible does not teach. The Bible teaches it is appointed unto man once to die in Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, once to die. And after this, the judgment. There, there, there is no further chance. It's judgment. And so who were these that were preached to by the Lord Jesus Christ? Now we will get into this and we'll be showing you some of these amazing and wonderful truths that we'd like for you to know. You say, Brother Summerall, now how can we fight? You say that we are engaged in the battle of the ages. Uh, if that be so, how can we fight? How can we know how to fight? We want you to know how to fight, and we want you to win. And uh, if you would read with me from the book of Ephesians, uh, in chapter 6, I'd like to read to you, uh, beginning along there about verse 10, and if you'd open your Bible, you will follow me, please. The great apostle says, Finally, my brethren, notice he's talking to brethren, please. He's, the sinner can't understand this, and so he's talking to those who can understand who are the brethren. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. <laughs> your strength must always be in God. Your strength must not be a mental strength, which is your soul, and is a soulish thing, your mental capacities. And your strength must not be in the physical, in your body, because your soul and your body fell with Adam in the garden, and it cannot sustain you in the hour of trial, in the hour of difficulty, in the hour of problem, it cannot sustain you. And so we must, we must fight the devil in the area of spirit, our spirit with God's spirit. And if you fight in that area, you can always win. He says, brethren, be strong in Jehovah. Our strength is in God. My strength is not in Lester Sumrall. My strength is not in, an, in a church denomination. My strength is not in a doctrine. My strength is in a person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He said, be strong in the Lord, be strong in Jehovah. And in the power of his might, in the strength of his might, our strength is to be in his might. He is a mighty God. He spoke worlds into existence. He spoke the stars into existence. The extragalactic nebulae was made by the hands of our master and spread throughout the glorious uh, area of the void of space. And so he is the creator of these things and we love him because he is a God of love and that he is a great and mighty creator. And so our strength is in the power of his might. So if we see an enemy, we don't engage the enemy upon our own abilities. We engage the enemy by the power of the creator, by the power of the Son of God. Now remember that because that's where you get the victory and there's where you become strong when we realize that the battle is in God's hands providing we're working with God. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand against the wiles, that wiles means tricks, against the tricks of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the tricks. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle, neighbors, our battle is not in the area of human beings. We do not fight people. We do not fight organizations. We just don't do that. I've heard men fight communism until they were black in the face and they didn't stop communism at all. We don't fight, we don't fight ideas and ideologies and philosophies. Our battle, the Bible says, is in the area of fighting a person named the devil. He says we must know the tricks of the devil and he would like for us to fight against something else. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Whereunto he says, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. To be able to stand in the evil day. Now, if you wish to stand, you'll have to stand in the armor of God, the power of God. So the battle is there and the battle is real. Now, the Bible says it's a battle. And our whole theme here is the battle of the ages. But the battle rages on to victory. We don't lose anything. The battle rages on to victory. Now, you must believe that. There are too many defeated Christians in the world today. There are too many friends that the devil has knocked down and they didn't jump up. And we must believe and to know that God is real and his power is real. And there is a battle going on in the world, but we are part of the victory. We're not part of the defeat. We're not part of the sadness. We're part of the victory. You say, Brother Sumrall, how in the world did all this thing begin? How did it begin? It began in heaven. It began up here with, with Lucifer, who is called the son of the morning. He is called the anointed cherub that cover it. In Ezekiel chapter 28, it's where the battle all began. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. This is to Ezekiel, mind you. And he was saying, son of man, take up your lamentation against the king of Tyrus. The devil has so personified himself in nations, in nations, in cities, and in men, until they have been identified with him. In this instance here, whoever was ruling that land was a personification of the devil. I can show you in this reading how that is so very true. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord, thou that sealest up the sum. No human being has ever sealed up the sum of anything, and you know it and I know it. So it is speaking to us of Satan, the anointed cherub that God created. And this cherub was the covering was the covering angel of the throne of God. There's the throne of God. And he was the covering angel uh, that covered the throne of God. He says, you were full of wisdom. No human's ever been full of wisdom, but this creature was full of wisdom. He is the anointed cherub that covered it. And he said, you were perfect in beauty. No human's ever been perfect in beauty. But this one was, this creature was, because he is the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. There are three, three of the great archangels. There's Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer. Uh, Michael, no doubt, and this will be a study we'll take up with you one day. Michael, no doubt, is the, is the mighty fighting forces of heaven. He and his angels, which are a third of the angels of heaven, uh, combine the fighting forces. And anywhere in the Bible where there's a fight, uh, he's always there. But Gabriel uh, was the angel that delivered the messages. He was the, the servant deliverer of messages. And whenever you find communication involved, you'll find this archangel there. Lucifer 
was the archangel that covered and shielded the throne of God. <laughs> and his was in the center. Michael was on one side and uh, Gabriel on the other side and Lucifer in the center. I'm going to teach you one day where the church of the Lord Jesus will fill that vacancy in heaven. It'll be the most exciting study you've ever had in your life. Oh, you'll wait for it, and we'll have it just like this, and uh, we hope in the very near future. In fact, you can write for it and ask for it, and we'll see that it gets to you uh, very soon. Now, this person that was so uh, full of, of beauty and perfect in, in, in beauty, he says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, we know that no man was there because only Adam and Eve were there. He says, You have been there. And every precious stone was thy covering. And then it names the stones. Well, the only place for that covering was before the throne of God. Before the throne of God. And it, num it enumerates all of the, all of the beautiful stones. Uh, you can read it for yourself, Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verses 11 through. Uh, and he tells them about all the things that he did. And, and he says, Thou was perfect until the day that thou was created until sin was found in thee. So thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, uh, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity, until iniquity was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. That's when he lost heaven. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. You see? He was one of, the, one of the archangels, and he was one that covered the throne of God. I wouldn't say he was more important than the other two archangels, but he was the central one that covered the throne of God, and the majesty of God flowed through him with all these beautiful stones all over him. It flowed out to the rest of the universe. And all it saw, it says he was in the midst of the stones of fire. You say, well, what happened to a person like that? Now, your Bible tells you, so look it up. It's in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 18. And it tells you here, O thou covering cherub that was in the midst of the golden sword, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. <laughs> it was a creative beauty. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He was so beautiful that he went to the mirror too often. I said, ooh, look how pretty you are. That's pretty dangerous. You don't want to be doing that. Uh, look how pretty you are. Because of thy beauty, thou was corrupted by thy wisdom. Clever people have problems that dull people don't have. You just believe me. And also, he says, because of thy brightness. Then God says, I will cast thee down. I will cast thee down out of heaven. And he says, thou shalt be upon this earth. And then he says many more things about it here. And, and they're very exciting. Uh, that all people will look upon him and, and they will see him. Now, that was the beginning of the problem right there. That was the beginning. You say, does the Bible tell any more about it? Yes, the Bible does. If you would like to read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, uh, chapter 14, you can begin in verse 12, and you can see there, uh, reading for several verses, about this, this creature. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cast down to the ground that did weaken the nations? Neighbors, no one ever weakened the nations but Lucifer. When you see a nation weakened, when you see Great Britain weakened, when you see France weakened, when you see the United States facing problems that it cannot overcome, Facing problems at home, from riots on one hand to water gates on the other hand. Facing problems that it does not, not able. When you see them facing an inconclusive war, like they have, for example, in, uh, in, in Korea, and like they had in Vietnam, an inconclusive war. When you see a nation come to a place like that, the Bible says it is Satan that weakens nations. Our nation is weakened because of sin and because we're following Satan. That is the, the reason uh, for the weakening of the nations. And he, what did he do? Let's look in Isaiah chapter 14 for a moment. He says that he said, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the midst of the north. They say that the, uh, the, the men that understand the heavens, astronomers, say that in the north, where there's an emptiness, must be where the throne of God is. And I think that's true. I think in the north, in the north part of the universe, it's where the great Jerusalem will come down, and it is the part. And it's what the Bible says here. He says, I will ascend unto the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. <laughs> here is a, a, created, a created being that was going to take the place of God. It was going to be like the most high. That's the reason so many people go to hell, trying to be gods, little gods. Neighbors don't do that. You are not 
You are not sufficient in yourself. You are not sufficient in yourself. Please believe me, every human being needs a power outside of himself to guide him in this life. We need God. We need the Savior. We need the Bible. We need the Bible to teach us the truth. We need God to direct us. And we must have God or we go to the wrong place. We do the wrong things. We have the wrong attitudes if we don't have God. And so we find the battle of the ages began there by a self-assertion of a creature that stood up against God. And so God cast him out of heaven. And he became, the Bible says, the prince and the power of the air. I'll give you a couple of scriptures that you can mark down if you like. They're John chapter 12 and also John chapter 14, John 12 and 31. And also Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 to 6. We'd like you to uh, just mark those scriptures down. He became the prince and the power of the air. Now we come to the next stage of this, and we'll see what happened. When God planted Adam and Eve in the garden, he loved them. <laughs> you know, God made the, the stars, but they couldn't kiss him goodnight. God made the constellations, but they couldn't love him. And so the very apex, and the very acme of all the creation of God was when he created one that could love him. And man is the result of that. God created man in order to have one like himself. In Genesis it said God created man in the likeness and the image of God. In the image and likeness of God. God created man that way. Man can love God. Flowers are beautiful, but they can't love God. Mountains are glorious, but they can't love God. Seas are mysterious, but they can't love God. Only man can love God. So you were created to love God, and God loves you. It is a mutual love. Now, if, if someone wants to hurt God, seeing that God loves you, how can they hurt God? Only, only one way, hurting you. And so we find that when, when he was cast out of heaven, this, this fellow Lucifer here, when he was cast out of heaven, he came and looked. And he saw this beautiful place here that God had made. And these beautiful people that God had made, Adam and Eve. And they walked with him. They talked with him. And he became angry. He said, I want to destroy God. How can I destroy God? Only by destroying what God created. How can I make God angry? By touching that which God loves. And so he came into the Garden of Eden here. And that's where the battle began on the earth. It moved from heaven to the earth at this point. The battle of the ages. And so he went and deceived Eve with the fruit of the tree that you see here in the background. He deceived her. He deceived her three ways, by her body, by her soul, and by her spirit. Now, we will be teaching you that also in a few lessons from now. How she was deceived first by the body. The devil says, look upon this tree, you see. He, he focused her attention physically. He did not at first say, worship me. He did not say that he had ulterior motives. He said, now listen, honey, just look at this tree. Isn't it pretty? You see? He moved in on her, in her physical being. Your body is the weakest part of your personality to fall in sin. And the devil will always hit you there first. And when he looked, when she looked and said, oh, that is beautiful, he said, well, look a little closer. Did you know if you ate one of those, you'd be real clever? He moved instantly from the body to the soul, which is the mind, the emotions, and the willpower. So he moved into her mental capacities. And immediately he won another battle. She says, yes, I'd like to be more clever than, than Adam. Of course I would. And I'd like to be as clever as anyone else. Sure I would. And so he appealed to her soul. She fell there. She said, yes, I'd like to accept that. And then he moved to the third stage. And he said, did you know you'd be like God? Well, that's into the spirit of man. You see, into the spirit of man. And so he hit her. Bing, bing, bang. Three times. Body, soul, and spirit. She fell every time. Bop, bop. She was destroyed. And the Bible says, and Peter that Adam was not deceived. That's this truth. He saw what happened to her. In order to be like her, he ate the fruit. In order to be like her, he ate the fruit. That was the beginning of the battle. And standing right in this place here, God spoke. And he said, I will prepare the seed of this woman that you have deceived, and her seed will bruise your head. Neighbors, that began this battle for 6,000 years on the face of this earth. And that's what I want to so badly teach you about. That began this enormous, amazing battle upon the face of this earth when God said, the seed of this woman will bruise your head. Walking out of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve went out to do two things. 
Adam and Eve went out of the Garden of Eden, she was to bear, she was to bear children in sorrow and in pain. He was to work the ground from a king, he became a slave. At first, he was only to dress the place and to rule over it. When he walked out of the Garden of Eden, God said, by the sweat of your brow, you'll work the ground now. And so they went out. But the devil walked out and Lucifer walked out and he said, now, I've got to watch her seed. Do you think it a strange thing that just a few days later here that Cain and Abel were here offering a sacrifice and Cain slew Abel? It wasn't a strange thing. The devil was there. Satan was there. Lucifer was there. He says, now, one of these may be the Messiah. One of these may be the one that destroys me. One of these may. He said, I know, I'll make this one kill that one. And then I have liquidated both of them because a murderer could not bruise my head. And so he caused the first catastrophe on the face of the earth. He caused Cain to slay Abel. And that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the great battle, the battle of the ages. Now in our next lesson, we will continue and show you the sons of God, why the flood came. The flood did not come because men were bad. And we'll show you how the battle has raged right down until our time. Lord Jesus, bless our friends as they know the truth, because the word of God says the truth shall set you free. Amen. May the Lord bless you real good and real big. And may these studies in depth and in truth bless you and set you free. And we're delighted to be with you. And we know that this is the day of enlightenment. This is the day of knowing that we know. And this is the day that God has made to teach us the great truths of God. And we trust that you will receive these truths with all your heart, with a changed life, and with a great blessing upon your life. God wants to do something great for you right now. Receive all the blessings of God. Receive the, the literature that we have prepared for you that will teach you, teaching literature, that you might know the truth of God, the truth of the Word of God, and also the truth of why certain things happen to you. You'll have an understanding and a comprehension of life that you never had before. Believe me, we're going to move in the truths in depth that will help you to understand the vicissitudes of life as you have never known them before. Now, we'll be back with you for further studies very shortly.